Paul the Dauntless by Basil Joseph Matthews Chapter 2 The Loom of the Tent Maker The dark-haired boy, Saul, as he grew up, took in with his swift brain and quick eyes the wonderful life of the city in which he lived. Tarsus stretched across a great plain, through which a winding river ran, from dark, snow-rimmed mountains down to the shining sea. From the mountains of Taurus, and from the great high plain up behind the mountains, long caravans of dusty, stealthy-footed camels came striding down, bearing on their backs wool and lead and silver ore and many other things from the north and west. From the lands of the rising sun other camels came, bearing silks and spices, and led by dark, swarthy Arabs. Up from the great sea, as they called the Mediterranean, the ships sailed into the lake harbor, bringing glass from Sidon and purple cloths from Tyre, copper from the island of Cyprus and marbles from Italy and Greece. On the ships were ruddy-faced men from the west, dark, bronze-featured sailors from the Nile, and skillful seamen of Phoenician blood from the Palestine coast. Saul would see these things in company with other boys, for in him the instinct that makes boys get together in groups was stronger than usual. All through his life he was very eager for companionship. Yet sometimes the boys would quarrel, we may be quite sure. Saul had a keen, quick temper which caught fire swiftly and would blaze into clean anger. But we know that sullenness was a thing he did not understand. Again and again, when he quarreled with another, he soon made it up again. He would go as a boy, then, sometimes with other boys, sometimes with his father, in and out among the streets of Tarsus, dodging out of the way of the swinging camels and of the wide horns of the black buffaloes dragging their lumbering wagons along. Each shop along the streets was just a square platform, closed on three sides and open at the front, where the cobbler sat sewing the shoes, red or black, just as you wished, and the tall moccasin boots which he sold. The coppersmith hammered his pans, and the silversmith, working his tiny bellows, heated the gray silver in the forge and tapped it on his little anvil. The saddle-maker cut and sewed his leather trappings for the horses and the camels. The potter's hands molded the whirling clay, this piece to a lovely vase, that to a common household pan, but all to some use. The click and swish of the loom as the weaver threw the shuttle across and back again like lightning held Saul most of all, for this was to be part of the trade he himself was to learn. A great Jewish rabbi said, The father who does not teach his son a trade makes him a thief. And another teacher, whose words passed from mouth to mouth, declared, The father who teaches his son a trade makes him like a vineyard fenced around. Whether Saul's father was rich or poor, he would, as a good Jew, teach his boy a trade. The most famous trade in all Tarsus was making the tents under which the wandering shepherd peoples on the plain and among the hills could shelter. They were long, low tents supported by a number of poles, and with the edges of the canvas held to the ground with tent pegs. Miles away, up in the hills, near the great mountains, in the suburb of Tarsus, where Saul and his sister and mother and father went in the summer, he saw the long-haired goats of this land of Cilicia. The hair of these goats was used by the tent-makers to weave into the tent-cloth, for it kept the rain off the backs of the goats and therefore was good, when made into thick canvas, for keeping the rain out of the tent. Young Saul was taught how to make the tents. First he learned how the thread was spun from the goat hair, then how these threads were strung from beam to beam on the loom, and the shuttles were shot from side to side till the threads were woven into a cloth. After that the pieces of cloth were sewn tightly together to make one great canvas, and twisted goat-hair ropes were fixed to the edges, all looped ready for the tent pegs. Faster than the swiftest weaver in all Tarsus could throw his shuttles or rattle his loom, the brain of the boy Saul worked. He saw the weaver throwing the different colored threads, purple, green, and yellow, across his cloth, and Saul's own mind had three different threads to weave into the wonderful pattern of his mind. As the colored threads in the weaver's loom flashed to and fro till the eye could not follow, so the three threads of this boy's life, Jewish, Greek, and Roman, crossed and recrossed till they were all blended in one wonderful pattern in the brain of this boy, 
the mind that was yet to become one of the swiftest, most daring, and yet tenderest that have ever lived. 1. THE THREAD OF THE CENTURIES The first thread was the rich long thread of the story of his own people. It glowed through his mind like a lovely purple thread in a king's mantle, woven on the loom of the centuries. Saul spun the thread as he sat in the dim light of the synagogue, and saw them take up the sacred rolls and opening them read out of the law and the prophets, and as he squatted on the sand-strewn floor of the school and shouted out the stories he had learned from memory, but most of all this thread would come from the story times at home. Saul's mother, when she had ground the corn into meal and made the dough for the thin flat loaves of bread which she baked in the mud oven, and as she sat spinning while they waited for his father to come back from the marketplace, would tell him the stories of his nation. They were tales to make a boy's eyes grow round and shining with wonder, stories to make him catch his breath with excitement as to whether the shepherd boy or the giant would win in the fight. Her tales were his picture book, the greatest book of adventure in the world. Through her eyes, Saul saw the old patriarchs riding on their camels along the horizon of the old, old times, and pitching their low black tents by the side of the springs of water. He shivered as he watched the uplifted knife of Abraham ready to slay his son Isaac, and breathed again when the ram's horns were caught in the thicket and the boy Isaac was free. He heard how Rebekah watered the thirsty camels at the fountain and rode under the blazing sky into the land to meet Isaac, and how her sons Esau and Jacob quarreled and were friends again. He could see Jacob terrified because the coat of many colors belonging to his favorite son Joseph was brought to him all dabbled with blood, when all the while young Joseph had been thrown into a pit by his brothers, for the brothers were tired of his dreams of being greater than they, and sold him to the slave dealers, who had carried him off with their camel caravan into Egypt. The most exciting part of the stories, young Saul would feel, began where the tale of the father of his own tribe came, when Benjamin, the youngest son of Jacob, went down as a boy to Egypt. There all the brothers saw Joseph but did not know him, for he had become the greatest man, next to Pharaoh, in all the land, until, unable to hold himself in any longer, Joseph told them who he was. Saul's hot temper would flame up in him, and his heart would go throbbing with anger when he heard how the Israelites, after Joseph died, were lashed with long-thonged whips by the cruel Egyptian taskmasters under a new pharaoh. But his eyes sparkled again as he saw the little Moses, first hidden as a baby in the bulrushes, and then growing up to lead his own people out of Egypt away across the Red Sea, with the chariots of Pharaoh galloping in vain behind them. The story of those days in the desert was told him and the long, weary wanderings of the people in their tents till, on the great hills over Jordan, they looked across and saw the new land in which they were to live, the land from which young Saul's own father and mother had come. What was the law that Moses left for us to obey? the mother would ask, and the boy would repeat the words that every Jewish boy learns as soon as he can speak. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Saul came to know by heart also how Joshua led them all across Jordan and conquered the land, how Samson carried off the gates of Gaza and smote the Philistines, and how at last, blinded and chained, he thrust out the giant pillars and hurled the great house and its three thousand insolent feasters into ruin. The boy Saul would enjoy those fierce stories, but his mother would rather tell about the boy in the temple who waited on Eli, and would very much wish that her boy might come to be like young Samuel. We can well believe that Saul himself would prefer those about his own namesake, whom Samuel had anointed king. Would he ever grow as tall as that great warrior King Saul, who stood head and shoulders above the others and led all the people in the great fights in the valleys and on the hills against the Philistines? We can imagine him measuring himself against the wall to see whether he was growing tall, and then running back to hear how David killed the lion and the bear and the giant Goliath, and after Saul died, became king in Jerusalem. And now, young Saul's father told him, Jerusalem and all the land was under the hand of the Romans. 
their old country did not belong to them but one was coming and their eyes burned like gleaming coals with a fire of hate and of hope as they said it a king sent by god who would roll back all the enemies of the jews a leader who would save them they must wait and be ready when the hour came when he the messiah prince that was to be would call them out to fight in all the stories and every day whether walking with his father or sitting on the housetop with his mother or listening in the synagogue he would hear these words to love the lord your god and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul they were written on parchment and put in little leather cases strapped on the foreheads of the men and on the arms of the growing boys and were written on the doorposts on the fringe of saul's coat was a cord of blue if any greek boy in tarsus had asked him why it was there saul would have answered at once from memory put upon the fringe of each border a cord of blue and it shall be unto you for a fringe that ye may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the lord and do them this great invisible god could not be shown in the likeness of an image a statue of marble like those in the greek temple which saul passed on his way to school once every year he would see the streets of tarsus all alive with crowds waiting for a great procession to pass if he was allowed to watch he would see a great canopy over the image of a god who was being taken to be burned for the god of the tarsians was burned each year in the belief that he would come into immortal life again through the fire saul had been taught to scorn such a superstition about an idol when he ran home to tell his father about the gorgeous procession his father would surely frown and remind saul to repeat his hear o israel the lord thy god is one god 